So thank you very much to everyone for joining us tonight um, from far and far and wide. I see uh, Michelle asked where people were from, I think, and there were some people saying they were coming in from India and Mumbai. So a very warm welcome to, to everyone and those of you in London, especially during these rather strange times. So we're absolutely delighted uh, to welcome uh, Michelle uh, Wang, Dr. Michelle Wang, who's Associate Professor of uh, Asian Art History at Georgetown. Um, she's a specialist in Buddhist uh, art and Silk Road art of Northwestern China between the sixth and the 10th uh, centuries mainly. Isn't that right, Michelle? And um, at present, she's working on uh, Buddhist uh, uh, sculpture of medieval China. Um, but tonight, uh, she's going to talk to us of Dung Huan and kingship uh, on the silk routes. And we're really very pleased and look forward, sorry, I'm just trying to admit people <laughs> to your talk very much. So um, thank you very much. And I saw on the chat, someone suggested maybe your parrot could join in. So <laughs> can you hear me, Michelle? You need to unmute. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you now. That's great. Okay, great. Okay. Um, so I start sharing my screen? Yes. Um, Matthew, can you share this? Yeah, uh, making uh, Michelle co host? Yes, you're sharing. Okay, good. That's right. Uh, let's see. And let me start from the beginning. Oh, ah, yeah. Let me start. First. Okay, great. Um, uh, thank you so much for your introduction. Um, Allison, it's such an honor to be here at the RAS, and I'm grateful to all of you who have taken time out of your day um, to be here today. And before I begin, I'd like to express my sincere thanks to Allison Ota for her kind invitation, um, to Maddie Bradley for the arrangements, and to Susan Wakefield for facilitating this event. Um, thanks to the wonder of Zoom, we can all stay connected um, with one another in these times, and I hope that these connections will carry us from our digital present into the analog future. My paper today examines Buddhist notions of kingship along the medieval overland silk routes in Northwestern China. I explore how these ideas were expressed in Buddhist devotion and visual culture. And what I will demonstrate is that the Buddhist model of kingship became increasingly decentered, one that was focused upon the Buddha to one that was instead based upon deity cults that emerged from the oasis kingdoms of the silk routes. The historical circumstances that precipitated such a shift resulted from the fall of the Tibetan Empire um, and the increasing independence of Silk Road Oasis kingdoms from distant imperial centers. Um, despite prevailing notions that Buddhism is concerned primarily with spirituality rather than with matters of the mundane world, from the very beginning, Buddhism was intertwined with kingship. The earthly Buddha Shakyamuni, for example, was born into a royal family where he was sequestered inside the palace by his watchful father, um, King Shilodana, who was the ruler of the Shakya clan of Northern India. And in this painting originally from the library cave at Dunhuang, now in the British Museum, you can see two scenes, um, a fragment from a much larger painting of scenes from the life of the Buddha. So the bath of Shakyamuni at the top and then his first steps at the bottom. Um, let's see, Shakyamuni eventually left the palace and gave up his claim to the throne in order to become Buddha. And yet, his hagiography and iconography remain deeply bound to ideas of universal kingship. Major Buddhist monuments from the earliest period, such as the Ashokan pillar on the left and the Janta caves in India on the right, were the result of royal patronage. The Ashokan pillar on the left, um, and typically these stand between 12 to 15 meters in height, were carved with the edicts of the third emperor of the Mauryan dynasty, Ashoka. And they proclaimed the ideals of Buddhism and Ashoka's embrace of the religion's major tenets. The 29 rock cut cave shrines on the right were intended for Buddhist devotion and the housing of monastic communities with some of the most splendid constructions um, likewise sponsored by kings. The Buddhist ideal of kingship may be summed up in the concept of the wheel turning king or the Chakravartin or Chuan an ideal monarch who rules over the entire universe and who rules his subjects in accordance with the Buddhist teachings or Dharma. 
Various kings of the course of Buddhist history um, have been declared or declared themselves to be a Chakravartin, as I'm Shoka, who I mentioned previously. The Chakravartin derives some authority from two sources of power. The first of these is the wheel or the disc. You can see this in the lower left corner. Um, the chakra that rolls across different realms, um, bringing them under the uh, uh, wheel turning king's dominion. And the second um, is the modeling of the uh, Chakravartin's bodily attributes and life story after um, that of the Buddha. And on the right, for example, you can see um, a sculpture of the Buddha with one of the characteristic 32 marks of a great man, the Ushnisha cranial protuberance on the top of his head. Uh, more recently, scholars of Buddhist studies have pursued um, ambiguities in these um, models of Buddhist kingship that complicate the relatively straightforward concept of the Chakravartin, which I've just articulated. One of these, for example, is the tension between Shakyamuni's renunciation of the throne in order to become a Buddha, yet retaining attributes of worldly kings in certain iconographic forms, such as the wearing of the crown in certain images. Yet another is the contrast between the pacifist rhetoric of Emperor Ashoka's edicts and the devastating wars by which he greatly expanded the borders of the Mauryan Empire. In my talk today, I will demonstrate yet another contradiction um, in the visual culture of Buddhism, and that lies in contrast that we may draw between um, stasis and movement and between monumentality and liminality. I begin with a brief discussion of the Longmen Cave Shrines in central China's Hunan province. Um, located on the banks of the Yi River, this complex contains um, 2,300 rock cut caves um, carved from limestone cliffs and over 100,000 statues. Many of the carvings date from the 5th to the 8th centuries and may be attributed to royal or elite patronage. Perhaps the most spectacular sculpture at this site is a monumental statue of the cosmic Buddha Vairoshana, which stands over 17 meters in height. It is accessed now, as it was during the Tang Dynasty, um, by a set of stairs that permits the body of Vairoshana to slowly um, reveal itself to the viewer. Based upon a dedicatory inscription, it is generally believed that this cave shrine was donated by the Tang Dynasty Emperor Kaozong and his consort Empress Wu Zetian. The image of Vairocha and the cosmic Buddha seated upon a lotus pedestal is attributed to the Brahma's Net Sutra, um, believed to be an apocryphal or indigenous sutra, which dates to the fifth century CE. And it articulates a vision of the Buddha as um, coextensive um, with the entire cosmos. So that is to say, the Buddha's body is coextensive and interpenetrates with the entire cosmos. This in turn relates to the lotus petals, and you can see them here, um, of the Buddha's base. And a relevant passage from the Brahmasnat Sutra um, describes how um, Vairochana is seated on a lotus flower throne. And um, surrounding this lotus flower throne are 1,000 petals, each of which manifests 1,000 Buddhas, um, Shakyamuni Buddhas. And each petal also holds 10 billion lands. And each of those 10 billion lands um, similarly holds a single Buddha, a single Shakyamuni Buddha. And this particular form of Vairochana Buddha um, uh, was popular among East Asian monarchs during the medieval period. Um, and one reason for this was because it articulated a vision of centralized rule in which manifold Buddhas emanated from the lotus pedestal of Vairochana. Furthermore, the statue itself, by virtue of its proximity, um, more or less to the town that is the capital city of Chang'an, um, was also located at the imperial center. Finally, the layered associations between Buddha, imperial center, and capital are reinforced by the monumental scale of the image and its fixed position, having been carved directly from the limestone cliffs. So we can see that the statue is directly attached to the limestone cliffs and you cannot um, walk behind it. Um, next, I move on to um, the remainder of my talk, and here we'll focus on paintings from the Mokgao Caves. Um, which are located 25 kilometers southeast of Dunhuang. You can see Dunhuang located in the map on the left in the facade of um, this set of rock caves um, carved from sandstone cliffs on the right. And the site is comprised of 735 man-made caves carved into the eastern side of sandstone cliffs, stretching roughly 1.5 kilometers um, from north to south. The caves are divided into two groups by function and location. The nearly 500 caves in the southern group were painted with over 45,000 square meters of mural paintings in a style with more than 2,000 painted clay sculptures. The over 200 caves in the northern group served as habitation chambers for monks. And the legendary origins of the site are attributed to the fourth century CE. 
and the caves were sponsored by rulers, lay people, um, and monastics and served as spaces for public commemoration and private devotion. And here I want to introduce you to a plan of one such cave. There are actually a number of um, cave types, but um, this is the type that we'll be looking at. It's an open plan cave. And we can see that the antechamber opens to the east. Um, this is located to your right. And the antechamber is connected by um, a corridor to the main chamber of the shrine. This is located to the left. I think you should be able to see my cursor. And then typically in these open plan caves, um, there's a niche in the rear western wall of the cave, which contains the um, sculptural icons. And this is the type of cave that we'll look at today. So for the remainder of my paper, um, I examine mural paintings of Mahamayuri, um, the great peacock wisdom king um, that appeared at Dunhuang during the 10th century. And I argue that paintings of the great peacock wisdom king flourished in this particular place at this particular time um, because of the, the royal status um, actually of the deity. And here I want to reinforce once again that we're looking at a, an example of a deity cult. Um, um, so a, a cult based upon um, a deity that is the personification actually of a Buddhist prayer incantation rather than a Buddha. Um, let's see. And I argued that the deity appealed greatly to um, its patrons, um, as well as to the um, Central Asian clans with which they intermarried. And notions of kingship and epitropaic power were subsequently instantiated in visual form in a particular form of Buddhist statesmanship that developed between the closely allied Buddhist kingdoms of the Silk Roots. And at Dunhuang, images of Mahamayuri appear in eight cave shrines, and I'll read the numbers out to you. Um, Mogao Cave is 133, 165, 169, 205, which you see here, um, 208, 431, 456, and Yilin Cave 33. Um, they all date to the Kuei period um, between 848 to 1036, especially um, to the 10th century. And interestingly enough, they were painted over earlier iconographic programs um, and generally painted in the corridor, in the ceiling of the corridor connecting the antechamber to the main chamber of the cave shrines. Um, the Kuei-Adrian period, lasting between 848 to 1036, refers to a period of rule by local elites after the ouster of the Tibetans, um, who had ruled Dunhuang and other um, oasis um, states of Central Asia um, between um, 786 to 848, more or less. And although the Kuei-Adrian rulers pledged their allegiance to the central Chinese court at Chang'an, which is present-day Xi'an in central China, um, in Shanxi province, um, in reality, um, it was very difficult for them to gain acceptance um, by the central Chinese court, in part because their loyalty was called into question, um, being um, located on the periphery um, rather than the center of the empire. And furthermore, these local rulers of the Kuei-Adrian period had a great deal of autonomy and forged um, important interstate alliances with other Silk Road kingdoms. And so let's take a closer look at this painting. And um, Cave 205 originally dates to the early Tang Dynasty, but as I mentioned, um, this is an example of an overpainting upon an earlier painting. And so it's quite jarring actually to see these cave shrines in which there are later and earlier examples of mural paintings that are juxtaposed against one another. And this is considered to preserve one of the earliest examples of a Mahamiri mural painting at Dunhuang. This is painted on the ceiling of the corridor that connected the antechamber to the main chamber. And this painting is framed by canopies um, on the northern and southern ceiling slopes. And this is the only iconographic motif on the ceiling of the corridor. And um, we can see that um, Mahamayuri is shown with four arms and the deity is shown seated on the back of a peacock mount. And um, the peacock alights on an open lotus blossom. And I also want to call your attention to um, the sense of movement um, in the, um, the wings, uh, the peacock's wings that are held aloft. And um, the gentle curve of its outstretched wings echo the two lower arms of Mahamayuri. And it's a little bit hard to see actually, but they're um, right here. So two arms here, um, two lower arms here, and two upper arms as well. Um, let's see, the deity's two upper arms are held above the torso and the upper right hand holds three green and black peacock feathers. And uh, bring up peacock feathers alternating with flames. Um, as you can see here, um, here's the peacock feather held in the hand. Here are the peacock feathers in the mandorla. Um, so the peacock feathers alternate with flames and enclose the mandorla that flanks Mahamayuri, suggesting the affinity between the deity, um, the personification of a Buddhist prayer incantation and its mount, which is um, a peacock. 
Um, there are 10 attendant figures in total. We'll see other compositions that are less ornate, and several of these deities relate to a particular form of Buddhism that um, Peter Trash had done home during this time, a highly ritualized form of Buddhism known as um, esoteric Buddhism. And this particular visual representation, Laha Mayuri, adheres closely to a ritual manual attributed to the monk translator um, Amogavajra, and this is the ritual commentary spoken by the Buddha on the altar of the great peacock wisdom king's image, or Taisho 983a. And there's a description of the construction of the altar um, in this ritual manual, as well as the painting of the image. So to begin with, a square altar is constructed, and the specifications are given for its um, height and its uh, size. In the center of the altar, an eight-petaled lotus blossom is painted, and I want to draw attention to the lotus blossom um, at the base of this image upon which the peacock alights. And instructions are provided to um, paint the great peacock wisdom king on top of the lotus pedestal. And um, it's described as being ornately um, ordained, um, and ornately decorated with a crown, necklace, earrings, and armbands. And, um, and it, it is seated. Uh, so its vehicle is the golden peacock king. Um, so there is, there's a distinction made between the peacock wisdom king and the peacock king, which is the actual bird. And it is seated in the lotus position on top of a white, um, uh, on top of this golden peacock king. And it grasps a lotus flower in full bloom. Um, other um, objects that are held in the hands and the second hand holds several peacock feathers. And as I mentioned earlier, we can see that right here. And the majority of the characteristics that are given in the full passage appear in this particular painting, um, namely the peacock mount, the seated position of the deity on top of the peacock mount, the lavish barley adornments and the attributes held in the forearms. Um, these are white lotus blossoms of fruit and the peacock feathers. The peacock feathers are more than mere ornamentation and they represent the efficacy of Maha Mayuri in highly potent form. In an abridged version of the altar ritual, for example, one could simply place an image of the Buddha and several peacock feathers at the center of the altar rather than um, worshiping a, um, a full image of Maha Mayuri. All right, um, there are two other examples I'd like to show you, um, and these have been, been all, all published, I should say. Um, one is from K169 on the left, and another is from K431 on the right. And um, again, um, these show Mahama Yuri, the great peacock wisdom king, seated on the back of a peacock mount supported by a lotus blossom. So an arrangement very similar to what was described in the ritual manual. Um, and although these two images um, are depicted with far fewer attendant figures, and um, there are, um, let's see, there are worshiping figures located in the lower left and right corners, and there are minor deities shown in the upper left and right corners, all, um, all coming to um, make obeisance to Mahamayuri. And despite these divergences from the earlier model, um, and there are also differences in the number of arms as well, I should mention, um, there are important similarities to the painting that I showed you previously from Cave 205. Um, so, first of all, there's a um, small Buddha located in the crown of Mahamayuri, and the mandorla is encircled by peacock feathers, and the peacock feathers in turn are echoed by the peacock feathers held in the deity's hand. And it's a little bit hard to see on the right, but in the painting on the left, you can see the peacock feather here, and the peacock feathers are reading the figure. And um, all these paintings are located on the ceiling of the corridor that connects the antechamber to the um, main chamber. And I suspect that um, the antechambers that were um, overpainted as well probably um, were done, probably were rededicated. So um, often these have separate dedication panels, um, um, not filled in um, of the ones that I've seen. So I think that um, this seems to signal a very specific liturgical function for the antechamber and corridor in these cases of overpainting. And um, so these are the similarities. Nevertheless, there are stylistic contrasts. Um, for example, in the um, colors of the pigments, um, the thickness of the outlines. And so this makes clear that these paintings were all executed by different groups of painters, even though painted um, at roughly the same period of time. And what these demonstrate is that there was a consistent idea regarding the visual appearance of Mahamuri that circulated in 10th century Dunhuang. Um, that um, didn't necessarily adhere to the textual descriptions um, in the Mangavajra manual. And those of you who are familiar with Indian art, for example, know that there are some um, representations of, of such standing Mahamuri figures as well. Okay, um, so what I will demonstrate is that the appearance of Mahamuri imagery um, was due to the close alliance of the rulers of Dunhuang Forge with the rulers of Khotan, 
um, which was a Buddhist kingdom located on the southern rim of the Tafamakan Desert. And these um, the locations of Jinhuang relative to Khotan are located in the map at the bottom part of this um, slide. And that furthermore, that the cult of Mahamayuri was transmitted to Dunhuang from Khotan, uh, which is located in present day Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. And Dunhuang is located in adjacent Gansu province. Um, this theory of the origins and transmissions of Mahamayuri imagery um, is substantiated by um, visual material evidence, um, as well as by the circulation of the Mahamayuri Dharani or um, prayer and its translations. So to begin, I show you um, an image of the Bar manuscript. Um, and this was a manuscript that was a Poti manuscript written in birch bark and Sanskrit using Brahmi, um, discovered by Colonel Hamilton Bauer in the underground crypt of a stupa or um, Buddhist reliquary monument located in Kumtra, um, located in Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. And this manuscript contains three sections on the Mahamayuri Dharani, and there were other sections of this manuscript that pertain to healing and medicine. I'll get back to that in a moment. Um, next, there's a mural painting fragment purportedly from Khotan, um, again, located in Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. Um, and this was collected by Claremont Scrying in the early 1920s and um, now held in the British Museum. And here we can see in this fragment that there is a um, figure holding a peacock feather. And this is actually a very unusual attribute in Buddhist iconography. And so I would argue that this suggests that the um, mural painting that this fragment originally belonged to um, similarly depicted um, Mahamayuri. In addition to these, um, a previously unstudied um, painting acquired by the Metropolitan Museum of Art in 2007 lends further support to the interest in the Mahamayuri Dharani or prayer um, in the Tarim Basin and the possibility of transmission from Khotan to Dunhuang. Um, its date uh, coincides with or slightly predates um, the, the Mahamayuri murals in Dunhuang that date to the 10th century. And the center of this 9th to 10th century silk banner is occupied by a standing deity holding a peacock feather in the right hand and this point out by the yellow arrow and um, a golden bowl in the left hand, which pertains to Mahamayuri's medical properties or healing properties. And the presence of the peacock feather identifies the deity as Mahamayuri of the great peacock wisdom king. Um, one of the most intriguing features of this painting and one that um, confirms um, uh, Kotani's provenance that it may have been made in Khotan or perhaps made in Dunhuan by Khotani's donor, commissioned by Khotani's donor, is a Khotani's inscription. Um, uh, Khotani's, which is a middle Iranian language, and this was written in uh, Brahmi on the verse of the painting. So if you look at the uh, recto of the painting, um, the inscription bleeds through, and you can see this in the upper right corner. Um, however, this painting was taken off its map by the Metropolitan Museum. Um, in the past two years. And on the right, what I'm showing you is the verse of the painting. Here you can see that inscription more closely. Um, so we can see the image of Mahamiri is painted um, in mirror image on both sides of the silk. And this inscription was translated by Xin Wen and it's published in Argo that co-authored with him and Susan Whitfield. And it names the official, high-ranking official named Yoraisha who donated this painting. And this indicates a high-ranking official um, by Kotani's name. So it substantiates the association of this painting. Um, if it was not actually made in Kotan, at least with the Kotani's donor. And there are other examples of um, evidence from the Johan manuscripts of the patronage of Buddhist paintings, um, portable paintings and um, mural paintings by Kotani's donors. Okay. So next, let me move on to the Chinese translations of the Dharani Sutra. And um, by Dharani, um, this term in the title here, what I'm referring to um, is a type of verbal incantation or prayer um, in the Buddhist tradition. And um, Dharani's, um, let's see, a very rich and complex tradition. And um, suffice to say that they could be practiced in a number of different ways. So through the recitations, they're appreciated for their sonic properties and also um, shown in um, appreciate for material and visual forms as well. Um, so in this case, when I speak about visual representations of the great peacock wisdom king, I'm actually speaking about a personification of this Buddhist prayer incantation. And they're typically written out in Sanskrit um, syllables and often transliterated into Chinese and Chinese translations. So between the fourth to eighth centuries, there are six trans Chinese translations of the Mahamayuri Dharani Sutra that were completed. 
And the earliest of these were attributed to monk translators from the Tarim Basin Oasis Kingdom. So this further demonstrates the popularity and circulation of the Dharni in this region and substantiating um, perhaps a transmission from Khotan to Dunhuang. And um, give me the list of the translations here. So um, uh, Shimitra was a prince of Kucha, located in present-day um, Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, and later established himself at uh, Luoyang um, in the early 4th century. He completed two translations um, of this Dharani Sutra. And the third translation was carried out by Kumar Jiva, um, also born in Kucha in Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. And um, he likewise uh, uh, carried out a translation of the Dharani Sutra. And the various recensions of the Dharani Sutra offered a remarkable range of benefits. Let me actually move. Oops. So I think the PowerPoint is, has frozen for a moment. Um, okay, um, I'll just continue and then hopefully the PowerPoint will advance. Um, these various recensions of the Dharani Sutra, there we go offered a remarkable range of benefits, um, primarily focusing on um, protection and healing. And they offered recourse from suffering and safety from flood, fire, evil spirits, and thieves. And characterized as a collection of incantations, um, the framing story, um, well, there are two framing narratives in various versions of the Mahamayuri Dharani Sutra. And um, here I've indicated which framing story belongs to which particular recension. And in um, one version, the main character is a golden peacock king. Um, this is in Taisha 986. And um, the main character, the protagonist, is a golden peacock king, so a bird. Um, and it is it's explained by the Buddha. Um, this golden peacock king recites the Dharani or prayer um, daily, morning and night, uh, for protection. And then the other protagonist, belonging to the other framing story, is a monk named Svati who while collecting um, firewood in order to heat the bathing water for monks um, was bitten on the foot by a poisonous black snake, but saved through recitation of the same dharani or verbal incantation or prayer. And so this particular narrative appears in two versions and then the two um, framing stories appear simultaneously in three of these recensions. And, um, and I actually find this quite unusual, actually. Um, I find it interesting that um, a Dharni Sutra would contain two frameworks, two narrative frameworks, rather than just one. And since um, the uh, Kumar Jiva, I Ching, and Amogavasha translations, and these are the ones that I've indicated at the bottom um, part here that indicate both framing stories, that is, pertain both to the Golden Peacock King and to the monk, appear in the Dunhuang manuscripts we might conclude that both of these narrative frameworks concerning the peacock king and the monk um, circulated at Dunhuang. In the context of Dunhuang, um, which, um, uh, how might the frameworks, narrative frameworks um, of the Mahamiri Dharani Sutra have caused this particular um, Buddhist prayer to appeal to the patrons of the cave shrines in which the paintings of the deity appeared? To answer this question, we proceed from Khotan to Dunhuang and we trace the rise to power of local clans and close ties that were forged between the two kingdoms through intermarriage. In the period during which the Mahamayuri paintings began to appear at Dunhuang, um, that is during the 10th century, coincides with the rise to power of the Cao clan. And so you can see. Um, this name here, so the Cao clan of uh, the Guaychin period ruled between 914 to 1006. So they were the second ruling clan um, during the uh, Guaychin period. And they assumed power after succession crisis that was suffered by the first ruling clan, um, surnamed Zhang. And they subsequently ruled over Dun Dunhuang and Anxi until the year 1006. Shortly after the Cao clan came to power, diplomatic relations between Khotan and Dunhuang resumed for the first time since the Tibetan occupation. So similar to Dunhuang, Khotan, um, the Buddhist kingdom located um, along the southern Silk Roots, was also ruled by the Tibetans. Um, so for example, in the year 938, an embassy from Khotan arrived in Dunhuang bearing tribute. And then the king of Khotan made the second daughter of uh, Cao Yichin, whose name you see um, in the caption before you. 
And um, Cao Yichun was the first ruler um, of the, um, during the uh, Guaiqin period, uh, they came from the Cao clan. And in turn, his grandson, Cao Yichun's grandson, a man named Cao Yan Lu, uh, married the third daughter of the Cotanese king. So these two clans uh, were closely tied by intermarriage. Um, there was also a permanent Cotanese um, residency of palace um, in Dunhuang. And um, what I'm showing you here are two donor images. Um, the one on the left is of Cao Yichin, um, the person I just mentioned. Um, whose second daughter was married to the king of Khotan. And in addition to intermarrying with the Khotanese ruling clan, um, the Guichen rulers also intermarried with the Uyghurs as well. So on the right, you see not a Khotanese princess, but rather a Uyghur princess. Um, it is important to note that in half of the cave shrines containing Mahamayuri paintings, that they bear donor inscriptions that relate to the Guichen, that is the local rulers of Dunhuang um, after the Tibetan occupation period and or Guichen donor images. Um, so it's possible that there were more donor images and inscriptions, um, but in the remaining four caves, um, there's quite a bit of damage um, to the surface of the mural painting, so it's difficult to ascertain, but we cannot rule out this possibility entirely. Um, so we're turning to Mokau Cave 245, um, so you can see the two donor images before you here. And um, so as I mentioned, we see an image of Tao Yikin and um, his Uyghur princess. And there are several more images. Um, in the main chamber, um, this particular cave with um, donors um, from the Tsao clan and their names as well, inscriptions bearing their names as well. Um, so just to give you an example of other um, caves um, with Mahamiri paintings that bear Guayajun donor inscriptions or paintings um, in cave 208, um, there's a uh, Guayajun donor, so someone uh, associated with um, these uh, military rulers uh, named uh, Ying Guo San, and the Ying clan was an important clan in Dunhuang for many centuries, and several of their members were closely allied with the Cao ruling clan. And in Cave 431, um, this, which also contains the painting of Mahamayuri, um, this is, um, uh, also contains the names of several uh, Guizhun donors um, from the Cao clan. And then in Yilin Cave 33, um, there are donor images of another member of the Cao ruling clan, uh, Cao Yuanzhong, and his consort, Lady Jai. So therefore, interest in the Mahamir motif may be attributed to three generations of Cao rulers, in particular beginning from the first generation that intermarried with the Khotanese clan. Notably, the military governors from the Cao clan, especially those that were connected by marriage alliances to the Khotanese, as well as to the Uyghurs, um, were titled as great kings. And the reason why this is an important detail is because um, um, prior to this time, they were known as military governors. So that was the title by which they were known. So um, by um, titling themselves great king, this does um, king or great king or great king upholder of the West or king of Jinhuang, this does suggest um, an elevation um, in how they saw themselves. Um, so this seems to suggest a departure from their earlier um, uh, a practice of being titled as military governors. And this was also the same for the Cotanese as well. So previously they had been known as military governors. And then we see that there's also a practice um, from the first king of Khotan um, after the, um, they were uh, gained independence from the Tibetans, uh, Li Shangtian, that was his Chinese name, the Chinese name is Cotanese king, in which he was also known as a king. So here we can see three generations of the Cao rulers, those who are associated with the Mahamayuri motif, and they're known as Great King, Great King of Poldo of the West, the Great King Tao, um, and King of Dunhuang, and King of the Western Peace. Um, and this concept, I think, of upholding the West or keeping the peace in the West um, also relates closely to their intermarriages and their interstate alliances um, with the Cotanese and the Uyghurs. And the bottom, as I've shown you, the Cotanese kings were also titled um, um, as kings as well, um, rather than as military governors. And um, I think this is um, interesting because we might, this might suggest to us that the Mahamiri uh, Dharani appealed to um, Tao donors, that is these local uh, rulers in Dunhuang on multiple counts. Um, so first of all, the connection with Khotan, um, as I think I've demonstrated, there was a great deal of interest um, in Mahamiri in the Terran Basin. Um, secondly, the association with kings. Um, and then finally, um, the offer of protection or epitrophic power. And 
those of you who've studied Khotan know that um, the theme of protector deities um, runs deep in um, the Buddhist visual culture of Khotan. And here I'm showing you um, paintings from the corridor um, from Mughal Cave 98 the into the Guijun period. And so Vaishravana, for example, um, the heavenly king of the north, um, also with, um, who also have protective functions, play special roles of protector deity in Khotan and also to the, the founding myths of Khotan. This was one of a group of eight guardians of Khotan that were frequently painted in the corridors of um, cave shrines uh, during the Guijun period. And um, some of the cave shrines that contained the eight protector deities of Khotan also contain paintings of Mahamiri as well, such as Yilin Cave 33. And so um, if we think about the painting of um, these Khotanese motifs in Dohong Cave dating to the 10th century, um, these are caves um, for which the patrons were not Khotanese, but rather um, the local rulers of the Guaychun. And so in essence, we're viewing um, the Khotanis and their interest in protector deities um, through a local lens, through the lens of the Guaychun um, kings. What might have been the impetus behind this new emphasis on Khotanis motifs emphasizing kingship and protection? And one possible explanation lies in, um, may lie in a letter. Um, this is a manuscript. Um, so roughly 60,000 manuscripts from portable paintings and prints were discovered at Dunhuang, um, in sealed up in one of the caves. Um, and this particular manuscript um, was written by the Khotanese king, uh, uh, Vishashura, um, to the Guaychun ruler, Cao Yuanchong, and it's now held in the Bibliothèque uh, Nationale de France. And um, on the recto of this manuscript, uh, Vishashura recounts the Khotanese victory against the Karkhanids and the capture of Kashgar. And so it seems clear that there were increasingly um, battles that were waged um, against the Khotanese. And nevertheless, the Khotanese occupation of Kashgar um, stretched the resources thin, and this victory was short-lived as the Karkhanids continued to wage battle against the Khotanese throughout the latter part of the 10th century, and eventually defeated the Khotanese by 1006. The patronage of Mahamiri images at Dunhuang by Guichun donors then might be viewed as a way of putting their political alliances with the Khotanese on display and to pray for the protection of their kingdom. Um, it is possible that such images may even have been visible to members of the Khotanese royal clan, which maintained, um, as I stated earlier, a residence in Dunhuang. Furthermore, the Khotanese were not the only ones at war. So Dunhuang was subject to invasions um, by the Uyghurs of Shizhou and Ganzhou, and the Guichun regime grew um, increasingly weak after the rule of uh, Cao Yuanzhong. Therefore, epitrophic motifs such as Mahamayuri um, and the protector deity spoke equally to Khotanese and Guichun concerns regarding political strife, stability, and sovereignty in the post Tibetan period. In closing, the appearance of Mahamayuri motifs at Dunhuang coincided with the Cao clan's rise to power and their marriage alliances with the Khotanese royal family. The Mahamayuri motif likely appealed to Cao donors because of its multivalent associations with Khotan, kingship, and protection. Um, I argue that the Guichun rulers especially were drawn to Mahamayuri because of the Dharani's potential for um, epitrophic, um, um, its offer of epitrophic powers, um, as described in the narrative of the Golden Peacock King and the monks Lati. Um, given the increasing military pressures that were faced by the Khotanese and the Guichun, the epitopic power of the deity would have appealed to both groups, both ruling clans. For this reason, the circulation and display of Mahamiri images um, was a visual sign not only of the spiritual ruler, world of the rulers of Dunhuang and Khotan, but of their longstanding political alliance as well. And this image of the deity flanked by the kings of Dunhuang and Khotan, so this is the king of Khotan um, depicted on the right, um, suggests that um, perhaps Mahamiri was considered a king among kings or a kingly motif that was appreciated by kings. Distinct from the centralized and static image of Arachna Buddha from the Luman Caves, um, this image of Mahamiri was instead rooted in the form of a bird um, that is the golden peacock king, one that literally took flight um, between the oasis kingdoms of the Silk Roots. Okay, thank you very much. I think I can stop sharing my screen now. Right. Okay. Thank. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Michelle. Can you hear me all right? Yes, I can. Good. 
Um, has anybody got any questions? Um, well, I, I'll, I'll start off uh, with, with one just to, to get people warmed up. I was quite um, struck, I don't know anything about this topic I hasten to add, but I was quite struck by the palette that was used of the blues and greens. Is that particularly as, uh, associated um, with the representation of the Mahamuri or, or is it is it something that you find particularly in Cotonese painting? Because you had the pictures as well of the guardians as well in the same sort of palette. I don't know, it's just a completely off the cuff uh, um, uh, observation. Mm -hmm. Yes, so the um, we do see that the color palette changes over time and much of this had to do with the availability of pigments. Um, mm -hmm. And so um, there have actually been detailed studies um, carried out by the Getty Conservation Institute. So I would encourage anyone in the audience who's interested in learning more about the pigments, the value of pigments, and the type of pigments that were used, um, to take a look at the Getty website because their um, study of Dunhuang mural painting pigments is now available actually um, as an open access book. And what we see is that there were different pigments that were different available times. So some of these were natural pigments, they were mineral pigments, um, and others were synthetic pigments. And the availability of certain pigments would also have had to do with, um, I think, simply the flow of people and of goods um, during different um, eras, um, different periods of um, silk road commerce. So, so I would say that there is um, there is a color system in Buddhism, which is very important. And this goes back to the ritualized form of Buddhism that I mentioned earlier, esoteric Buddhism in which um, the different directions are assigned different colors and therefore um, deities are, are often um, painted, their bodies are painted in different colors as well. However, um, what's really strange is that this doesn't really seem to be carried out at, at Dunhuang at all. Um, this is much more apparent, for example, in Tibetan paintings. Um, so even when the same deity is depicted in different painting traditions um, at Dunhuang, we often don't see much attention being paid to those color designations um, that are associated with the cardinal directions, with the four cardinal directions. No, it's just I was just interested, and um, I just I don't think there are any any questions yet. No, I I have another one. Um, just uh, again, I was just wondering, um, would do you think who who actually painted these? Would 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 the artists have come from Kotan, or would they have been from Dunhuang or from other other areas? Do we know? <laughs> Yes, so we do know that by the 10th century, there was a well-organized painting workshop that was based at Dunhuang. And um, so, uh, let's see. Um, so uh, Sarah Fraser, for example, has done a detailed study of um, the organization of the um, painting, local painting atelier. Um, so this is attested to in the Dunhuang manuscripts. So for example, how they were organized, um, how they were paid. Um, so they're organizing groups in which there was a highly skilled um, I guess you would say a foreman um, in charge of painters. Um, and there was also a division of labor, for example, um, you know, who would put down the overpainting, who would fill in uh, the, I guess, between the outlines, so to speak. So we actually do know that for the mural paintings, that there was an on-site painting workshop. Um, as far as who painted the, and also we can't assume that, um, I wouldn't assume that all the painters were local or even that they were Chinese. I think it's impossible to determine ethnicity um, based on painting styles. Um, because what we see by 10th century, especially because there's such a large volume of paintings being made, which in a sense necessitates the establishment of an on-site painting atelier, is that the painting style actually becomes quite standardized. So there is something that um, you know, I've always thought of maybe as a, a Dunhuang workshop painting style that emerges during this period. I would say that we see much greater variation in painting styles among the portable paintings from the Dunhuang Library Cave. This is Mogao Cave 17 which is access to cave 16. And these were, um, this was the cave, um, the contents of which were discovered in the early um, 20th century and subsequently um, dispersed between um, many collections um, in London, for example, on the British Museum and Library and also in Paris as well. And there we see um, much greater variation in painting techniques and styles. And I think this has to do with the portability of those images and which they're not necessarily made um, on site at Dunham, but may have been made in other places as well. You know, and I'm also seeing some paintings on the chat. And then I think um, I Miller was first, and then I think Joel uh, Bordeaux is next. So um, should I just go to these questions? Did you want to read them? So the first one is um, uh, the image of the king has a figure behind the king. 
can you say what he or she is and what are they holding? That's, can yes. you see that? I'm, sorry, I'm actually going back to my PowerPoint, which is now frozen yeah. again. So please give me a moment, please. Uh, give, it a, give it a bang. <laughs> uh. Yeah, so this is slightly cut off in the image I have, and I think it looks like, based on the garment, it looks like a monk. So generally speaking, um, this is not a very exciting answer, but typically a figure standing behind uh, royal donors in Tin Hong paintings would be attendants. So these might be uh, members of the monastic community or uh, lay figures, members of the clan, and this looks like a monk. And I have to say it's very hard um i'm i'm leaning very close to my screen uh to see what that image is it may be i'm inclined to think that it might be a bundle of buddhist scrolls maybe a buddhist sutras because it looks like there are things that are rolled up um it's a textile wrapper um so that's what i think is is happening there other things that you might find donor figures holding would be things such as lamps or flowers for offering so typically buddhist accoutrement Right, we have another question from Joel. He's got his hand up. So I think if you can unmute, Joel. Can, he? Yeah. can you unmute? Okay. Can yep, you... now I'm allowed. Can you hear me? Yes. Pop up. Yep. Am I audible? Yes? Yes, yes, go ahead. Yes, I can hear you. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, this is, uh, I'm going to ask you to do something that's slightly comparative, I guess, if I can. Um, my apparently faulty assumption when I saw the peacock was that this is going to have something to do with sort of Skanda, Kartikeya, you know, sort of martial imagery, right? So the, the peacock would be the emblem of a, um, you know, of a war god uh, in an Indian context, which would make perfect sense to go along with royalty. But I don't see any weapons in the imagery at all. I mean, is this a what kind of a what kind of kingship are they expressing here that that there is no apparent uh, you know military imagery involved? Is there were there no and I guess uh, along with that were there not at this point in the the Buddhism in the region military images that they could have drawn on Bajrapani or or somebody like that that you know would at least have a have a scepter or something more overtly sort of royal in the way I would we would normally think of it I guess. Yeah, that's actually a really excellent observation, and it's one that's been consistently pointed out to me by South Asianists and Tibetologists, and you're absolutely right that um, there is martial imagery associated with the peacock um, as a mount, um, as a vehicle um, in the Indian tradition, and I think that um, my working assumption is that um, there are those associations with state protection, with that, that with protection, state protection, they carry over into the Dunhuang context, but you're absolutely correct, there are no weapons. That are held um, um, not by the peacock king and not by Mahamayuri. Um, there are there are precedents for the wielding of, of weapons of um, swords and and vajras and the like um, in esoteric paintings, but we don't we don't see that here. There are um, I don't have close up details of the attendant figures in the Mahamayuri paintings in the assemblies, but some of those uh, may be holding weapons as well, but not but they are not held by Mahamaya, you're, you're absolutely correct. And so according to the Dharani Sutra, the protective properties of the Dharani are, um, are conveyed simply by its recitation. Um, so um, perhaps you might say that the protective properties of the Dharani just come from, come from, its, rep rep um, come from its recitation. Um, and there are other examples, I think, in which um, the, um, I'm thinking particularly of the Chinese context in which the syllables of Dharanis, um, that their, their spiritual accuracy is conveyed in a number of different ways. So I'm thinking, for example, of classic studies of Dharani pillars. Um, this is clearly rooted, I think, in the, in the Chinese context in which the, their um, spiritual accuracy might be conveyed by the um, wind um, that carries the syllables from the surfaces carved on the surface of stone, Dharani pillars. Um, to devotees or from the shadows that they cast. So I would say maybe that there does seem to be a, a special power that's attributed to, to words, um, to words in this context that um, perhaps um, um, doesn't have the need for the wielding of, of weapons. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but, um, but I think it is an interesting case in which we do see the peacock vehicle in 
um, in different contexts, in the Indic context, and then in this context, in the Chinese Silk Road context, but, um, but the connotations do seem to be slightly different. Um, we have another question from Indu. Is there any special significance or meaning to the placement of the painting of Maham Yuri between the antechamber and the inner chamber? That's a very, very good question. It's one that I've been puzzling over. Um, and I think there is a special meaning when certain painting motifs are assigned to different parts of the K-shine of these architectural spaces. And one theory is just that the the, the corridor seems to take on special significance uh, during the Guizhun period. And this seems to be a place where um, protective deities are painted. So I mentioned earlier the eight protective deities associated with the Kino of Khotan. This is one place in which we often do see them painted. And so I might have to go back to um, a concept that I raised at the beginning of my talk that is um, one of liminality in which there's maybe a transformation that, that's undertaken when you um, move from the more public space of um, the antechamber um, to the more private space of the main chamber. So that'd be one theory I have. And secondly, something that I mentioned earlier, but I think will be a little bit more difficult to ascertain because of the lack of inscriptions from the dedicatory panels in the overpainted antechambers, is that there may have been um, the antechamber and, and corridor may have been assigned a new, um, a new liturgical function. Um, so with the overpainting and the painting of new new motifs. And so I think that is, that, that's the explanation that I have for now, but I have noticed in other contexts that um, particularly when we're thinking about motifs that relate to Khotan, um, the foundation myths of Khotan, um, the arrival of Buddhism in Khotan, that, um, that we often do see these motifs clustered in the corridor and not just in the ceiling, um, but on the main walls as well, the side walls. Um, so it does seem to be a part of the Kishon that takes some special significance, in and especially by the 10th century. So that's, a, that's an excellent question, one I'm still thinking mm -hmm. about. We have another one. Uh, when discussing the peacock standing in front of the throne, flaring its wings, I think you mentioned an aspect as a mandala. Could you say more on that, please? Um, yes, yeah, so I'm not sure what the question is uh, specifically, but... Um, so in the Amogavaja ritual manual that I mentioned, it does describe the painting of, well, the construction of an altar. And there's um, a close relationship between altars and mandalas in the um, Buddhist context, um, in which one understanding of a mandala is that it is a, um, not necessarily the sort of image that we might even associate with, um, you know, from visits to temples or museums in which these are, uh, two-dimensional paintings that um, are hung up on a wall, but in fact this was um, a template of sorts um, that was painted onto a flat altar, the horizontal surface of an altar, um, and this could be an image that was the focus of devotion or it could also serve as the template for the calling forth of deities um, during the process of uh, a ritual um, that focused on the mandala, and so there are detailed inscriptions for this in the um, Mughavajra ritual, as I mentioned, and there are other images, well-known images of Mahamir from southwestern China and Sichuan province, in which those are fully three-dimensional images. So statues that have been painted as Mahamir, and the those caves um, seem to have been constructed with um, just as much of, as, if not even more care, attention paid to the instruction provided in the Mughavajra ritual manual. I mean, it seems as if the caves themselves um, in the Thatsu region of, of Sichuan, southwestern China, seem to have been constructed almost as, um, I guess, three-dimensional altar um, ritual spaces. Um, I'm not sure if that answers your question entirely, but it's not unusual mm -hmm. um, within the esoteric context to um, read these sorts of instructions from ritual manuals about the paintings of deities. So the, the, the titular deity of the particular Dharani or um, Buddhist incantation and the painting of such a deity um, on an altar. Um, for the purposes of, of esoteric ritual. Right, now we have a, a, another question. How many manuscripts have just <laughs> survived from Dunhuang approximately, I think we can say, and where can we see them both in fact and in translation? 
<laughs> so about 60,000 um, manuscripts, portable paintings and woodblock prints, and there are textiles as well, um, textile fragments. And um, so I don't know where you are dialing in from, but um, so there, there are large collections of these materials. They're held in London and Paris, um, the British Museum, the British Library. Um, I don't know if they're open. I think the British Museum is still closed. Um, and also in Paris um, at the um, BNF, um, and at the Musée Guimet, um, there are collections in Japan. Um, and recently I've um, been involved with a project in which um, we have, with a collaborator, um, a, a postdoctoral fellow named Dr. Miki Morita, um, she has tracked down um, Silk Road objects located in North American collections. So not only from Dunhuan, but from other Silk Road sites as well. And there's a website, um, the International Dunhuan Project website. And um, I wonder if, if one, kind person in the audience could put that could look that up on the internet and drop that link in the chat for um, this member of our audience. But the International Dune Home Project um, has a database and many of the, um, the manuscripts have been digitized and put online there. And currently the International Dune Home Project is, oh, thank you so much, Catherine. Yes, it's focusing on conserving and digitizing the Lotus Sutra manuscripts um, in Chinese. And I should say also that the manuscripts are a rich treasure trove of materials because they are um, they appear in many many languages, so not just Chinese, but many Chinese, Tibetan, um, Khotanese, uh, Uyghur. I think there was actually a question about the, the last letters that was that was written in Khotanese um, and Hebrew as well. And they're not all religious, so they're also secular manuscripts, secular manuscripts, so um, contracts. Um, Primers, poetry, Confucian classics. Um, so absolutely. So it's a um, it's a great area of research. So I don't know if you're a researcher, but I encourage you to, to research that. And there's a book actually in open access by a colleague, um, Imre Golombos at Cambridge University. And a quick Google search should take you to it. Um, I think it's published by the Gritter, um, but it was just released, I think, in the past two months or so. And it's an open access book about the Dunhuang manuscripts. And of course, Susan Woodfield, who's in the audience, was the founding director of the International Student Home Project. So one of the first of what we would now call digital um, humanities projects. Right, okay. Um, I think, it, I don't know if Matty can put it up on the on the screen, maybe, uh, the um, International Dung One Project um, um, address. Maybe he can do that, um, if he can find it. It looks like Catherine has put that link in the chat. So if you would take a look in the chat, you can see an answer given at 2.25 p.m. Oh, that's wonderful. Oh, great, good. And um, we have another question. What was the script in the last but one slide? Cotonese or Uyghur? Oh, yes, that, that should, so, be, <laughs> should be Cotonese. Cotonese, right. And then we have another question. Um, how can you tell which panels have donors, or which I suppose which are donors, and which are dead Buddhas or Bodhisattvas, etc.? Um, to, uh, to clarify uh, what aspects of the painting signify to you what they are, I think that's the question there. Yeah. Um, sure, that's a very good question. Even when you know that an image depicts a deity, it's not always clear on what that deity is. And um, Buddhist iconography is not a, um, it's not an exact science. Um, there's a lot of slipperiness uh, between the attributes of, of deities. And so um, I would say the easiest way to tell the difference between deities and donors is that the donors are typically wearing um, earthly dress and the deities might be wearing um, Indic, perhaps even an archaizing, archaizing style of dress. Um, they'll often be wearing crowns. Um, they will be adorned with jewelry. The Buddha is often dressed in a very distinct way with a very simple robe. Um, as I mentioned, oh, there are crown forms of the Buddha, in which the Buddha is wearing adornments. Um, those are relatively um, less common, but um, and the deities often are seated. Um, they may be seated on animal vehicles, um, such as uh, Mahamayuri, um, seated on the back of the golden peacock king. Um, the Buddha, on the other hand, will more often than not be shown seated on a lotus pedestal, um, such as the monumental carving that I showed you earlier. And donors, donors are usually standing. I can't really think of major examples in which donors are shown seated. Um, they're often smaller than images of the deities. Um, this does change at Dunhuang. So by the equation period, this is the same period during which the 
painting atelier is established at the cave sites in which there are many, many paintings. Um, there are made new paintings as well as over paintings um, in which sometimes the donors become very, very large, um, almost as, as big or larger than the size of Buddhist deities. Um, so the donors will be shown wearing lay dress. Typically male donors are painted in one portion of the cave. Um, they'll be separated from, so they'll be separated by gender, male and female donors. And they're more numerous in number and they're often shown in a static position, usually shown in profile. And they may be holding items um, such as flowers or, or lamps um, for offerings, um, but not the sorts of objects that um, Buddhist deities would hold. Um, so Buddhist deities, um, may hold things like, like lotus blossoms, um, they may hold scrolls, and going back to a question that was asked earlier, they might hold um, Buddhist ritual um, objects, um, even weapons, um, and we wouldn't expect to see donors holding those objects. So I think once you develop an eye for looking at Buddhist art, that distinction becomes very clear, that is between donors and deities, um, but it's the distinction between deities that's a lot trickier to untangle. Um, thank you. And there's another question here. There is a Mahama Yuri statue in Ellora, India, that seems to be a female mm -hmm. deity of education. Has there been any comparison between uh, Mahama Yuri depictions in India and those in Khotan or Dunhuan? Um, not a lot. I think scholars who work on China are aware of the allure image that you mentioned, and that's a standing image. So as I mentioned earlier, um, those in the audience who are more familiar with Mahamiri imagery from India will notice that um, that Mahamiri is shown standing rather than seated on the golden peacock king vehicle. Um, I think that the question among scholars of Chinese Buddhism and Chinese art has generally been whether um, the origins of uh, well, where do the origins of Mahamiri imagery in China emerge? So do they emerge from the Silk Roots, as I'm arguing, or do they emerge from southwestern China, from Sichuan province? And it's a little bit difficult to make a direct comparison to the image because the Chinese images um, typically show um, Mahamiri seated, and in India that image is standing. Um, and also you mentioned gender, and that is a um, very tricky question, another one that I haven't quite um, uh, figured out how to answer. So. Um, uh, um, Mahama Yuri is referred to in uh, the text, including some of those texts that are translated to Chinese as, um, as female, as being feminine in form, but that feminine form that is referred to in text is not carried through in images in China. And there's probably more that could be said about female imagery in the esoteric Buddhist context in this particular ritualized form of Buddhism, but, um, but there does seem to be a gap in these Chinese slash Silk Road representations between the, the um, at times female gender of the deity referred to in texts and the masculine imagery. Great, uh, thank you. Um, I think uh, though I've just got one new message. No, I think it's a thank you. Fascinating, there we are, that's a comment. So thank you very much, Michelle. I think we'll, We'll give you a rest now and you can return to, to talk to your parrot or your, your bird. So thank, thank you very much indeed. It was really very, very interesting and I think rather inspiring. I think we're all going to go and look at those uh, paintings again. And um, a big thank you to everybody for attending. Um, we really appreciate it and we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you very much and thank you, Michelle. I'll, I will be in touch in, in time. All right. So thank you. Good night. Thank you so much, everyone.